Okay, welcome everybody to another lecture. Today's unit is roster staff. The unit code is SITXHRM002. We will be going through all of the lecture slides today and doing the activities as they approach us. So feel free to take um, the you know the given amount of time between to do each activity so you'll need to pause the lecture recording uh, as you approach those activities if you feel confused at any point or need to maybe revise any sections you're more than welcome to revise and replay this lecture recording at any time this lecture recording will be available in your student portal so, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email or ask me in person. My email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au Alright, let's get into it. So, develop staff rosters. 1.1 Develop rosters according to relevant industrial agreements and other considerations and wage budgets. So the importance of rosters, so the reason why rostering is important is so that we ensure that sufficient number of people with the correct skills are due to work at certain times. So, you know, we want to fulfill every role that is needed for us to, you know, essentially keep our business open. So we need to make sure, even though we may have three to four people on the roster that could do the job, but we need to make sure at least one person is filling all the roles that we do need and accordingly so if we need three people to the same role we'll be rostering on three chefs or three cooks and etc etc right so we also want to do it because the workload can be um, distributed evenly among employees this provides a useful means of communicating with our employees so as a manager you don't want to be telling every individual person when they're working so if you're creating rosters you know most likely you'll be creating a digital roster you can send that through to your um, workers and colleagues and employees where they'll be able to check um, when they're working where they're what section they're working at for how long they're working for um, if anything that they might require for that shift any specific things if they need to and they can bring it with them and it provides you with an opportunity to plan where resources need to be used so you could essentially do the budgeting after you've done the rostering to see how much it's going to cost you for that specific week or month or or day so relevant industrial agreements award for tourism travel and hospitality so for us we're really in the, um, you know interested in the fast food industry award or the hospitality industry award but if you're you know working in events or recreation you've got that first one there which is the amusement events and recreation award um, then we've got the car parking award so if you're working in maybe venue management or security or things like that or valet parking you've got that there for you then we've got general retail industry awards such as you know it could be that you are stocking shelves or um, doing retail sales or things like that and then we've got the traveling shows award so this could be a circus this could be a tour or some sort of festival that's going around from different suburbs or towns or cities and you're traveling with them all right so for us we're interested in the fast food industry award 2010 and hospitality industry award uh, 2010 Right, annual leave for each year of service with his or her employer an employee is titled to four weeks paid annual leave employees who are described as a shift worker are entitled to five weeks paid annual leave the employer should not be unreasonably refuse to agree to a request by the employee to take paid annual leave Compassionate leave. An employee is permitted to two days of compassionate leave for each occasion when a member of their immediate family or a member of the employee's household contracts or develops a personal illness that poses a serious threat to his or her life, sustains a personal injury that 
um, poses a serious threat to his or her life or dies. So you want to remember these three points, okay? So you want to make sure that if you are a uh, employee that has worked a year, you are um, eligible for four weeks annual leave. If you are a shift worker, you are eligible for five weeks annual leave. And if there is a compassionate illness or um, a death in your immediate family, meaning family members or you know household members, um, you're allowed for two days compassionate leave. <coughs> Parental leave and related entitlements. An employee is entitled to 12 months of unpaid leave when the leave is associated with the birth of a child of the employee or the employee's spouse or de facto partner. The leave is associated with the placement of a child with the employee for adoption. The employee has or will have responsibility for the care of the child. Maximum weekly hours. An employee should not be required to more, more than 38 hours a week by an employer unless the additional hours are reasonable. Where the extra hours are reasonable or not should be considered in relation to the employee's personal circumstances. Standard overtime and penalty pay rates. These include weekends, public holidays, overtime, late night shifts, early morning shifts. So activity 1A, what are the relevant awards that you must follow when developing rosters for your staff? So in this case, for us, as I mentioned before, the important awards that we're looking at is the Fast Food Industry Award 2010 and the Hospitality Industry Award 2010. All right, how much annual leave are workers entitled to in Australia? So if you are a full employee and have worked for a year, you are entitled to four weeks paid annual leave. If you are a shift worker, you are entitled to five weeks paid annual leave. What should be taken into consideration when determining whether additional work hours are reasonable? So you want to take into consideration if you know their health, their social life, um, you know if it permits them in their circumstances, if the organisation really needs for them to do those hours, um, if you're going to be putting you know um, uh, overtime and uh, special uh, payments for those hours, and they're not going to be the regular payments, and the worker is willing to do those hours um, you know the level of responsibility that the worker might have in those times um, how much notice they might have so if it's you know on short notice and you want them to work then those are you know unreasonable if it's let's say um, you know they need to start a shift in an hour it's a it's an unreasonable request so they might need to be paid on a um, you know special penalty rate okay so complete those then we can move on to the next one so come back unpause the lecture and we will continue on Develop staff rosters. 1.2. Maximize operational and customer service efficiency while minimizing wage costs. So examples of surveys that you could use include personal interviews, questioning takes place face to face, postal surveys, handing customer surveys to complete or sending them directly to them, telephone interviews, speaking to customers over the phone, internet survey sending the customer an online survey to complete customer focus groups a focus group is a method of um, qualitative research whereby participants are questioned about their uh, perceptions expectations or needs regarding a particular topic product or service so this could be you know a menu item this could be a new service style or venue or you're just doing some market research to change up a new menu. Conducting a focus group enables respondents to expand on each um, other's answers, potentially providing more detail than individual interviews. Customer needs and expectations. Common customer needs and expectations include friendliness, 
empathy, fairness, clear instructions, and options and alternatives. Minimizing wage costs. Examining sales information can also facilitate the efficient rostering of employees. So look at your sales figures with other senior personnel and establish when your facilities or events experience um, their busiest periods. So generally you will require the largest number of staff during your busiest period. So think about us as cooks or chefs. We are much busier on the weekends than the weekdays so we might need more cooks on the service line on a let's say Saturday compared to maybe on a Wednesday we might not need as much cooks. We could only get away with one. Let's see. <laughs> right. Recruitment. There will need to be a decision made about the type of job being offered. You might require full-time employees to work long hours, casual or temporary staff if you only require them to work for a short period, or part-time staff if there are particular shifts that need to be filled with quality employees. Speak to a minimum of three customers about their current experiences of customer service and their needs and expectations regarding customer service. Outline three common needs and expectations that customers have of employees and what considerations need to be made about policies and procedures in relation to the impact of um, leave and overtime on wage costs. So if we're thinking about, um, you know, uh, minimum three customers about their current experiences so we need to essentially talk to three different individual people we want to think about the level of service that they want and what type of service they want so in this case your colleagues or your classmates um, will be your three different customers so if we were speaking to three different colleagues um, we want essentially you know different opinions about what type of service we should be doing. So if we're thinking about, okay, um, our customer service is very um, hands-off, meaning the customer has to approach the, co um, the employee, then it means that there is more onus and responsibility on the customer to, um, you know, finalize a sale compared to let's say somewhere more of a dining situation with um, you know waiters seating those workers they might be taking them to the table waiting on them until they decide on a menu item that they want to order then essentially you know them consuming that and then paying at the end so there is a variation of customer service between you know fast food and then a dine-in restaurant okay so then if we talk about catering that's another issue where you might say there is n essentially only customer service for the introduction phase so meaning that um, the customer who is essentially purchasing the food for a bulk party will only face a customer service situation meaning that you know the chef is maybe going through the menu with them and essentially taking down their order for a large function or a wedding or a birthday but after they've supplied the food that's it there's no more back and forth between the worker and the customer so you know there's a different level of experience there as well okay so we've talked about fast food we've talked about dine-in restaurants and we've talked about catering so we want to split that into three different customers and you know essentially hopefully you get some sort of feedback um, from your you know colleagues or customers there alright so now for number two outline three common needs and expectations that customers have of employees well this is general right if you if you're going in to any business think about what you would expect you know um, for them to be welcoming to be friendly um, you know knowledgeable you think if you have questions about the item they should be able to answer it not say oh I don't know you know um, they should be able to understand what you're trying to ask them 
should know the language at least um, what else they, they could be um, giving you options for upgrades or giving you you know a more catered service to recommend other foods you know with your order they could be giving you you know if they've made mistakes they could be apologetic they should be treating you with respect many things like that so just outline three there and just um, briefly describe what they should be like I said before so if you're thinking being friendly saying hi having a smile if you're thinking um, you know knowledge about the menu being knowledgeable having um, in-depth knowledge about the menu to where you can ask them questions and then they can explain to the products to you if they're then we got you know um, apologetic and them being fair in such cases if they've made mistakes they will apologize and try to uh, make it right with you and try to solve the problem to the best of their ability All right, number three what considerations need to be made about policies and procedures in relation to the impact of leave and overtime and wage costs so if you think about it um, it's much more effective to have more staff um, have them on part-time and not have too many full-time employees um, just but it creates a disloyal base so you gotta weigh out which one is more important it's also important to have casual staff on the roster so if situations do become risky and your employees might say oh I need to take leave or I don't want to do overtime you can call someone that's a casual and they can essentially come in and work those hours that you need them to um, yeah you're also thinking about how many times has this person done it um, is it regular has the person worked for us for a full year are they entitled to paid leave should we giving uh, should we be giving them overtime or should we be hiring someone else and training them so we don't have to pay extra you know uh, award wages over the award wage um, for overtime and we can just hire more staff and train them to work those extra shifts for a regular but if it's a regular thing um, yeah so all these um, you know having casuals on or having paid people on permanent making you give them paid leave or things like that or you know government legislation meaning that you know you're paying um, a certain amount of super tax for people who've worked over a certain amount of money if let's say if you're hiring younger people you could be saving money and paying them a lower wage depending on what their age range is if the older they are the more you have to pay them okay so there's a lot of factors so include all that I've said there include some of your own and then come back and unpause the lecture and we can move on to the next section All right, 1.3. Combine duties where appropriate to ensure effective use of staff. So employee profiles. By having employee profiles that contain information about the skills and experience of each employee, you can assess the needs that are required at a particular time or certain events and match these to the appropriate worker. So let's say if I can cook Mediterranean food and you've got a Mediterranean function, and you have a customer profile, oh, a pro employee profile that has that information, then you can see that on the database and say, okay, we're going to hire a joy for that function, so because he knows Mediterranean. But if you didn't have that profile, then you wouldn't know what experience I have. Combining duties, benefits of combining duties, uh, you know, you can prevent from having to recruit new individuals to cover sickness or parental leave. It enables employees to build their knowledge and skill set. You also enable, um, you know, employees to maneuver during shifts in particular quiet or busy periods, so you can switch them in and out. And it can also help in increase operational efficiency because they know how to do more tasks essentially.
Alright, in what ways can you ensure staff members are capable of combining different duties within the workplace? So first of all, training is so important in this case, right? So if we're talking about training, um, somebody has to review those outcomes. So have they been trained? Can they do those job roles? Um, we want to highlight things such as um, what their skill sets are and what they were before. So have they grown from having a smaller skill set and now they have a larger skill set? Maybe we could talk about um, looking at um, qualifications that they might have or different certificates that we can get them to train in and then once they have those qualifications we can say yes these guys are qualified and recognized so we can put them in those positions um, we're also looking at maybe um, mentoring you know uh, if we want somebody to take over a certain position we might not just um, fire the old employee and put the new one there we might give them a buddy system where the old employee would be mentoring them um, and essentially before the old employee moves on to the newer job role um, they would be teaching the younger employee what is required in that um, duty okay so number two what are the benefits of having employees combine their duties so like we said before you know um, it can help increase the efficiency and the output within the company it can help um, move around staff when needed as in if you have someone sick you can say okay John you can also cook Mediterranean so because Jack is sick can I get you to stay back for a few hours so you can cover him or you can say you know employees um, will also start growing for your company meaning that they would have more knowledge about the work tasks and essentially if there are um, you know situations where workers leave or they need to take certain time off you can hire or increase workload for the employees that you already have and you don't have to go through training for someone new okay so include those in your activity for number two once you're done come back and resume the lecture and we can move on to the next 1.4 roster teams with complementary skills mixed to meet operational requirements so rostering staff with complementary skills examples of skills or qualities that may be required include leadership strategic ability knowledge of the industry service provided physical ability customer service skills and experience of working with children Rostering based on relationships. It may also be beneficial to separate individuals who have conflicted in the past. This may involve having them work um, at alternating times of the day or at different locations. Similarly, if there are employees who have proved to work well together in a team, you may decide to place them on the same shifts whenever possible. So essentially we're looking for the most productivity as my, and try to lessen any conflicts that we can. So what skills or qualities may be required within a team that you need to consider when rostering? So for this question, we're looking at, um, you know, you want your team to be, um, have physical ability, have experience working with children, have great customer service skills, uh, knowledge of the industry and um, the service that you provide or the knowledge on your product have great strategic ability and problem solving skills and hopefully everybody has a leadership quality so they can take um, control of any situation that may arise alright so number two based on your answer to the previous question describe why it is important to have employees rostered um, who can demonstrate these skills and qualities so especially when you have those qualities Right. Each of those qualities means something. So if, if they're a leader, that means they can, if a problem does come up, they can guide you through it. Right? If, if they're a problem solver, meaning if there's a new problem, they can think about what possible solutions could be. If they have great customer service skills, 
your customers will be happy with you, right? If you if you've got um, experience with working with children, when you do have customers that have children and they come in, then it's a lot easier to approach them and to sell to them um, compared to you know if you didn't have any experience working with children. And a lot too, most parents don't want um, somebody who doesn't have experience with children to be around them anyway. So it's a lot more beneficial if you know how to deal with children that um, you have those type of employees working at the time that you expect children to be a customer of yours. Um, then we're thinking about skills and knowledge. So if a customer comes in and they ask you a question, you should know, um, you know in-depth knowledge about the thing that you're trying to sell. You shouldn't have to ask somebody else. Um, it the excuse of saying oh, I'm new here can only work for so long you know after a couple of weeks if you keep saying oh, I'm new I don't know it's not going to be helpful for you or the company alright so put some of your own thoughts in there as well and then once you've completed that come back and unpause the lecture and we can move on to the next one alright 1.5 Take account of social and cultural considerations and broader organizational policies that affect staff rosters. So organizational policies. Policies that affect staff rosters include annual leave, personal carers leave and compassionate leave, public holidays, parental leave and related entitlements, mandated at breaks, maximum allowed shift hours, permanent or casual staff, standard overtime and penalty pay rates. Uh, state and territory discrimination laws, so we're thinking about um, Discrimination Act um, 1991, we're thinking about for New South Wales, Anti-Discrimination Act 1997, and so on and so on. So as we're in New South Wales, we'll be looking at the Anti-Discrimination Act 1977, but if you're in other states, the other acts also apply as well. Uh, social considerations may include parental responsibilities, employees may have responsibilities involving children, they might have responsibilities caring for family members, so they could be you know, a primary carer for somebody that's injured or ill, and that could be one of their main functions at home. Um, leisure activities, employees you know, may have hobbies or um, things that they like to do outside of work, so this might um, kind of um, you know, restrict when you can roster them or not, and as well if they do other jobs. So some people might only be working with you for part time, and work on a hobby or have a um, main job that they do, which they love and they focus on. Okay. All right. What policies does your organization have in addition to industrial arrangements? So industrial arrangements, obviously it's given by the government, we pay the award wage, but we've also got things such as um, overtime, we've got um, also for us we've got benefits of um, you know giving staff discounts, we've got rewards programs for employee of the month, we're giving them benefits, um, uh, there's so many if you're thinking about uh, what else what else what else if we're thinking about maybe um, such as giving people you know time off or having days off where they can really recover so like a group of days where they can recover if they've got special festivals or like cultural activities we can allow for them to take off as long as um, the whole team doesn't take off, then it's all good. Um, unless we decide as a team and the business that we all want to take that specific holiday off, then yeah, we can decide to do so. Um, yeah, and then there's you know restrictions on how many employees can take annual leave at the same time. We spread that out, so not everybody's gone at the same time. Um, there are situations where, um, you know, you you won't be able to take leave because there is somebody already on leave 
meaning that you're the only one that can cover those shifts so that your request for annual leave might be refused because somebody is already on annual leave or it's not the right time alright um, so include those there for number one and then we're thinking about what social factors you may have taken into consideration when developing rosters so we're thinking about you know hobbies or leisure activities or sports or um, specific times of the week that the worker might like to have off we're also thinking about maybe there are parental responsibilities for cer certain workers maybe they have kids or then there's caring duties for specific family members that they might have that depend on them that might be sick or injured um, you could also think about um, employees who might have other jobs where this is not their primary job so there's many factors but yeah just include those three and if you have some that in mind you can also include that as well um, complete those return back to the lecture when you're ready and we can move on to the next one all right 1.6 consult with colleagues to ensure input into rosters so consultation with colleagues you might want to establish the following from colleagues cultural needs so this I was talking about the festivals and holidays that they might follow from their cultures social needs or responsibilities some might be that they have hobbies or like weekends off or certain whatever their skill set so if they don't know a certain job you can't just put them in the role training and qualifications they have so some jobs require certain people to have certain qualifications and if you're let's say a security guard and you um, want to serve alcohol but you don't have a, a RSA there's no point for you to serve alcohol in the bar if you're only qualified to secure the bar right desired hours of work desired method of communicating the roster so you know if they're not used to using um, a mobile phone or email maybe you have to give them a printed form or maybe put it in a central location where everybody can come and see physically All right methods of consultation methods of consultation include meetings emails letters or notes suggestion boards telephones or speaking in person so continuing it from colleagues a human resource or operations manager also needs to inform colleagues about procedures for reporting unavailability so I like to say give two weeks notice at least if you need to take days off um, unless it's an emergency if it's you know you want to be planning two weeks ahead so your um, person or supervisor who is responsible for creating shifts knows what's going on so such as you know personal carers leave or compassionate leave or requesting even annual leave all right so describe three aspects that you may want to establish from colleagues when developing rosters so we're thinking about you know um, their cultural needs social needs skill set training and qualifications their desired hours of work um, and how long they want to work and how they want the roster to be communicated to them for number two we're thinking about what methods of consultation can be used to consult with staff members about rosters so we can use meetings emails letters suggestion boards telephone speaking or speaking to them in person so complete that when you're done we can move on to the next one All right, 1.7 use roster systems and equipment to administer rosters so when rostering using online systems the majority of applications enable any changes to be emailed or sent by SMS to alter staff um, to alert staff of any late alterations to the planned schedule or when annual leave has been approved such systems can save significantly reduce the time amount of paper um, or you know how long it's going to take you for producing rosters the benefits of online rostering um, systems include it enables a fair process of allocated shifts employees can input into the rostering process as well 
training can be implemented into the roster with ease and you're less likely to lead to problems than allocating by hand and systems can be designed so that there are no violations to industrial agreements and organizational procedures so like we said the word wages or if it's overtime or things like that the system can let you know that you're going overboard or you're spending too much on that day all right provide at least three benefits of online rostering so there's so many there so you could say um, you know it provides a fair process for allocating shifts we're less likely to go into problems when we're allocating with the rostering system compared to doing it by hand and we can design systems to be aware of award wages our budgets any violations or industrial agreements that we're going against and things like that so it can alert us and stop us from making mistakes it allows employees to have an input on their rostering process and it allows us to have a fair process for allocating shifts as well all right so complete that include all of those at least three minimum but if you include all of them it gives you more chances of being right obviously um, once you've done that come back and we can move forward with the lecture okay 2.1 Present rosters in required formats to ensure clarity of information according to organizational standards. So types of rosters include full-time rosters when employees work on a full-time basis and the workplace is operational seven days a week. Part-time and casual rosters, a separate roster that is uh, introduced for part-time and casual staff. And duty rosters used to alternate the duties that employees will undertake during the shift. Type of rosters include cyclic rosters implemented to alternate undesirable shifts between staff. Shift rosters contain the specific hours that employees are required to work. Staggered roster, this is where the number of staff or the start times of the staff differ. And split rosters are used when the organization requires employees to work over separate periods. Alright, so 2.2a, uh, what workplace factors impact on the type of roster that needs to be developed? So if we're thinking about um, such as, you know, the number of employees, um, how many people we need, depending on how our organization works, um, you know, what work or what sections are busier, what roles can the employees do? Can they multitask? Do they know all sections? Um, or do they need supervisors, managers, things like that? And what sort of contract they have? Are they part-time, casual? Are they, um, you know, full-time? Are they, um, you know, uh, do they have responsibilities at home? You know, things like that. Okay. Uh, describe the use of two different types of rosters so there's usually what we do in hospitality is we use the staggered roster so we have a um, a roster of workers who start at different times so essentially one might pick up after the other as the period of our service might be longer than we can have workers in the workplace for so Essentially, if we're doing full full time work, we can work for eight hours, right? Um, so, but most restaurants might be open from breakfast till dinner. So then you might need to have two or three people doing the same role. So the staggered roster um, essentially have different start times. Um, they account for different you know times of business. So meaning, in breakfast you might be busy at lunch you might not be busy at all and then dinner you might be very busy so you'll need a different amount of people uh, as you get busy so for example restaurant managers might use um, you know this roster so that they can schedule on more people according to the time and not all people might be full-time or part-time or whatever it's just so that we can service the customers as we predict they will come another roster that we use is uh, part-time and casual so 
a separate roster that introduces a part-time or casual staff when trade levels you know dictate the need for more so such as public holidays we'll need more staff or if we've got certain holidays that aren't public but are more cultural you know could be certain um, uh, financial holidays such as like um, you know Valentine's Day it's not really a government holiday it's more of a spiritual and belief based holiday meaning that it's not really a, a day that you take off but it's more you spend time with certain people you know you've got Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day so based on those days you might need to roster on more people so that's when the part-time and casual rosters will come into play as well right so I've given you an example of two you can use um, any examples that you can have um, or you think of and you can explain a bit better but for me I've used the staggered roster and part-time and casual shift rostering okay so include those two there once you're done we can move on to the next one okay 2.2 .2. communicate rosters to appropriate colleagues um, within designated time frames so communicating rosters to colleagues so it is crucial for rosters to be communicated to colleagues as quickly as possible the communication methods may include verbally in person email through online software on posters on walls in memos in meetings uh, time frame so providing rosters with plenty of notice has the following advantages it enables colleagues to plan their lives accordingly it provides employees with time to report any issues with their planned shifts and changes can be made in advance activity 2b in addition to spending individuals um, sending individuals their personal rosters who else within your organization do you need to communicate rosters with so this could essentially we're thinking about the stakeholders right so who else is really um, involved in this situation so directors managers supervisors people that it will take effect on so if you're thinking about who is working with them you also need to let them know these are the people that are working with you right so people um, could be um, you know if you're thinking about owners or people in responsible for the budget or people that are from HR the human resources meaning that you know maybe they know people have conflicts and you've scheduled on people who have previously had issues with each other and then they can make you aware that no these two people can't work together right so yeah so you can talk about other employees um, who may need to know and be aware of it in supervisors managers owners directors of the company any HR personnel or any resource managers or anybody that's they're responsible for dealing with budgets okay so what are the advantages of providing rosters with plenty of notice so in this case you know for us if we give them plenty of notice it enables them to plan their lives accordingly and um, you know they can make changes in advance if they've scheduled something so now they know they're working so they can move it around and it provides them with time to report any issues with their planned shifts if they have so and they can maybe if you don't um, didn't know that there was certain thing on you can schedule somebody else to take over their shift or any anything else right so complete those two once you're ready come back and we can move on to the next one all right 3.1 administer records of shift time completed by employees or contractors and maintain staff rostering records according to operational organizational procedures so methods of establishing hours completed so using time cards to state time of arrival breaks and time of leaving work having a written signing in a uh, in and out system at the workplace using an electronic signing in and out system at the workplace requesting employees to email their supervisor when they arrive and leave for work each day issues with administering records of shift time employees may feel that um, they cannot be trusted to work their scheduled work hours and the time it takes to sign in and out 
particular during breaks can add up to time wasted. Furthermore, it becomes difficult to track the hours worked by colleagues who have to travel between different locations. Maintaining records accurately is important for a number of reasons. Firstly, it can protect an organization from issues in relation to industry regulations, such as you know the maximum hours worked and the regular uh, regulatory breaks or leave or anything like that. Uh, maintaining records can also help to settle disputes in relation to wages. Describe two different methods of establishing the hours worked by employees. So in this case, um, the two different methods would be essentially, um, well, there's so many methods, but you could talk about um, requesting them to email you when you start and email you when you leave. Um, use an electronic sign-in and sign-out system where you can use your thumbprint or have a specific code. There, You can have a written sign-in system, obviously, that's the most simplest one. And then you can use time cards, which you can punch into machine and gives you a um, stamp on the card from when you leave, when you take break, when you started, whatever. Alright, so... At least include two there. I've given you a few. It's just asking for two there. And uh, number two, the explain the importance of maintaining staff rostering records. So maintaining staff records, you know, is very important for a few reasons. You want to know how long somebody's worked. You want to know what, how long the breaks are. You want to know where you're losing money. You also want to, um, you know, be doing a review if somebody maybe not required and you're rostering them on maybe it can be done with fewer less people or maybe you need more people so you can highlight what future rosters may look like depending on how it's going you know if you're rostering on people um, that are casual regularly maybe you need to make them permanent so you pay them less in a normal award wage compared to a casuals wage which is much more expensive and also maintaining records is important um, especially in wage disputes, you know, if somebody's saying I've worked this amount, you've only paid me this, so you've got proof of their lock, um, you know, when they've logged in or clocked in or signed in, whatever it might be. Um, you can think about, um, you know, certain problems that might be coming up so, uh, due to rostering. Maybe there's always a, a problem with them coming in in the mornings. You could see, okay, they're always 15 minutes late. You could then say, okay instead of me paying you for those 15 minutes, come in 15 minutes after 9 o'clock and then we can start your shift from there. Maybe they have to drop off their kids or things like that, right? Um, yeah, if they've taken leave, you'll have records. If they've got jury duty or um, any um, compassionate reasoning or they might have to take off or they might have not showed up for work, certain things that you'd have evidence for. Okay, so include some of your own ideas for why it would be important for maintaining staff rostering records, but I've given you some of mine. So once you've completed that, come back and we can move on to the next one. So 4.1, monitor effectiveness of rosters in consultation with colleagues. So effectiveness of rosters, aspects that ought to be monitored. Um, has the rostering system provided the accurate or adequate level of staff at any time? Have employees been subject to working overtime? Do employees feel shifts have been allocated fairly? How has the rostered impact on the work-life balance of employees? And what is the level of absence from work? Signs of fatigue may include lack of um, uh, tentativeness, uh, incapability to concentrate, poor judgment or memory, finding it difficult to keep eyes open, not feeling refreshed after sleep, mood changes such as increased irritability or feeling withdrawn, and alterations to a person's health or fitness. Alright, so now we want to uh, describe a minimum of two aspects of rostering which you ought to monitor for its effectiveness so we can think about you know um, the ones that we've talked about before yeah has the um, 
employee been working overtime? Have they been doing shifts um, but that have been allocated unfairly? Has the roster impacted their work-life balance? Has it? Uh, have they been absent from work? Uh, how long have they been absent for? And yeah, are we rostering on the correct amount of staff for those shifts? Or are they too many or not enough? Right? So just, uh, it's asking you for two, but I've given you a lot more than that, so include as much as you can. So for number two there, provide three examples of negative consequences resulting from understaffing. So from understaffing, it's very clear, right? You'll have a bad customer service experience for the, the customers that come in. Um, you might have other employees that might get too stressed out because they're having to do too much and then may quit on you. You'll have more complaints from you know customers. Um, you'll also may have more increased times for your product. So instead of selling your item every 10 minutes, maybe now it's increased to 20 minutes, which is costing you money ultimately because you can't make more money. So you're not bringing in more money to hire more people. And ultimately your customers feel under, underappreciated or they might have you know feedback to give you that might not be pleasant okay so and it hurts your reputation of the business ultimately okay so include all of that in there once you're done come back and we can resume with the lecture and move on so 4.2 identify ways in which rosters and roster development processes may be improved and take appropriate action so methods of suggesting improvement could include um, a meeting or briefings through email uh, or a company notice board in written format through a suggestion box maybe or through face-to-face -face conversation. This may involve altering shift patterns so when you're taking action you're allocating shifts in a fairer manner, providing more breaks, increasing or decreasing the number of staff working at certain periods or recruiting new employees. So we're on to activity 4B. How could you alter rosters to reduce the levels of fatigue introduced um, by employees so you might include maybe um, you know increasing break times you might uh, allocate more shifts maybe break up the shifts a bit more and have more workers in so people don't get too tired too quickly um, you might consult with them to say okay which aspects of the job can be broken up and which um, you know, you might require more people in those sections, so you can hire more people and allocate more shifts in those certain sections that need more people. Alright, how could roster development process be improved in order to reduce understaffing? So, you want to essentially consult with everybody before you decide to allocate more shifts. You know, you want to know, are we actually busy? And if you are busy, the people that you're going to allocate to those rosters, do they have the correct skills to perform those tasks, right? So there's no point to hire more kitchen hands if you need more cooks, right? There's no reason to hire more um, cleaners if you need more weight stuff. It's just that simple, right? Um, yeah, so you want to make sure, are your employees capable, you know, working with children, can they lead? Do they have the skills to problem solve? Do they have those skills that you need? Right? Another way you could talk about, um, you know, we're thinking of um, hiring new staff or promoting new staff from within and training them so they have more skill sets. Or if we're hiring staff who are already skilled and then just slotting them in, in those um, sections so we can have more skilled people in the company all right so as these this is your last activity I'm guessing you would have completed your learner workbook by now so submit this to your trainer and if you've gotten any places that there are issues or you've gotten them wrong somewhere they can let you know um, if not then you're good to go so I would suggest now to complete your multiple choice questions so this is available in your student portal and can be completed online so I suggest you do that now, if you've got time. Um, your trainers will guide you through 
these assessments that need to be done in class. So you've got skill, knowledge and performance that will be need to be done in class and they can guide you to the best of their ability and you know essentially they'll tell you when it's scheduled to be so or you can find it on your timetable um, if it's up there. Um, so hopefully if you've got any questions or any feedback you can get in touch with me or any of the other trainers and we'll guide you to the best of our ability. My email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au so send me an email and I'll try to help you out to the best of my ability and hopefully that's it for today's lecture and I will see you in the next one.